scientists on the East Coast, and uh, good morning to the scientists on the West Coast. Welcome to uh, GenScript webinar. My name is Jeff Hunt. I'm the Vice President of Marketing at GenScript. It's an honor for me to introduce the speaker of today's webinar, Professor Howard Salas. Dr. Salas received his PhD degree in chemical engineering from the University of Minnesota and completed the, uh, his uh, doctor postdoctoral fellowship at UCSF in the laboratory of Christopher Wacht. He joined the faculty at Penn State University, where he is currently jointed, appointed in the biological engineering and the chemical engineering departments. He received the DARPA Young Faculty Award in 2010 and the NSF Career Award in 2013. He is also a member of a Synthetic Biology and in Engineering Research Center and the founder of uh, DeNovo DNA, a spin-off company that commercializes design methods for genetic systems. Dr. Salas' lab focuses on a few aspects of synthetic biology research, namely the biophysics of uh, gene expression and regulation, design and optimization of synthetic genetic systems, engineering cellular sensors, and engineering of uh, genetic circuits. And notably, one software developed in Dr. Salas' lab, Ribosomal Binding Site Calculator, predicts the translation initiation rates of natural bacterial mRNA sequences, which are validated in many bacterial hosts. And this software has been used widely for designing more than 70,000 gene sequences for protein expression purposes in the world. And I'm very pleased to announce that the GenScript has signed an agreement to in-license the RBS calculator to make the tools more widely available to both academic and commercial entities. And just before the webinar, uh, one housekeeping thing. Please use the chat box for your questions, and we're going to collect all the questions and answer them at the end of the webinar. Without further ado, Dr. Salas. The title of the, his seminar is Clone Less, No More, Efficient Expression Optimization of Protein and Pathway Using the RBS Calculator. Dr. Salas. Thank you very much for the warm introduction and for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, again, my name is Howard Salas. I'm an assistant professor at Penn State University in the Biological Engineering and Chemical Engineering Department. And today I'll be speaking about how our automated design methods for designing DNA sequences allows you to systematically optimize and engineer uh, both single protein genetic systems as well as multi protein genetic systems like metabolic pathways. And we really like the phrase clone less, no more, because at the end of the day, we don't want to clone you know, thousands and thousands of different genetic variants and then uh, have one of them that works well we want to be able to reliably predict and control protein expression in order to engineer a small number of genetic systems and have them work really, really well. So to continue, um, my, my research lab really studies uh, really foundational uh, biophysical uh, questions where we develop models that allow us to predict how much a protein is expressed uh, from its DNA sequence. Uh, and this includes both transcription, translation, uh, what controls RNA stability, as well as uh, different factors that work together overall to control expression. And we also uh, utilize those biophysical models to carry out systematic optimization of large genetic systems in order to build systems that work with a desired function. So for example, uh, we can input in a DNA sequence and predict translation rates we can predict transcriptional regulation, uh, and we can design new DNA sequences to get certain genetic circuits that work with a desired input-output behavior. We can design RBSs to optimize uh, protein expression and metabolic pathways. Why do we do this? Well, we really want to understand how gene expression takes place, the biophysics of it all. We also would like to solve very specific problems. And so in my lab, we've engineered pathways to detoxify lignocellulose, cellulose, to engineer RNA-based sensors for diagnostics and detection of interesting and, uh, uh, chemicals. And we've also re-engineered a large portion of central metabolism 
to rapidly regenerate NADPH and to overproduce desired products. So here's just a selection of different results from my lab where we've developed a biophysical model studying translation initiation, translational coupling, rapid switch regulation, transcriptional regulation, and applying our methods to map and optimize multi-enzyme pathways. I'll be talking about uh, a fraction of what we do in my lab today, really focusing on how to use the RBS calculator and our RBS library calculator to engineer single protein systems and multi-protein systems. Uh, but of course, students in my lab work on other topics as well. Uh, we have uh, spun off a company called DeNovo DNA, where we commercialize our design algorithms that allow you to design your DNA sequences for very specific and targeted uh, applications. So for example, the RBS calculator predicts translation initiation rates, the RBS library calculator designs RBS library, and the operon calculator designs whole bacterial operons. Uh, so you can see we have some branding going on. Everything is a calculator. Um, we, we you know, chose that name to make it sound uh, sim simple and easy to use, uh, which, uh, you know, as a result, many people have started to use them uh, in all sorts of different applications. We're up to 70,000 DNA sequences since 2010. Um, but really at the heart of all these different uh, methods is, is really a, a physics-based knowledge and understanding of what is going on. And we really want to push forward that physics-based knowledge and then to apply it to develop these automated design algorithms with very catchy names. So um, what is our objective for today? Our objective is to understand how to engineer complex genetic systems, to do that reliably and to do it efficiently, so that when you engineer a system once, you would like to learn something so that when you engineer the next system, you're not starting from scratch. You're actually learning something about how your system works so that you can apply it to the next product, the next system, and so the next product development time can actually be shorter. And this is, uh, this is a fairly, you know, uh, this is very common in engineering, and we want it to be as common in biotechnology. And so uh, who has used our algorithm and our design methods? Well, uh, several labs from all across the, the country and across the world have used it to express antibodies and P450 cytochrome. They've used our algorithms for expressing antigens in salmonella and enzymes uh, such as xylanases and gluconases. Uh, they've also uh, heavily used our algorithms for engineering metabolic pathways to make all sorts of chemical products uh, from terpenoids to butanol, as well as engineering nitrogen fixation to produce a lower uh, cost or, or a more biorenewable source of fertilizer. Uh, we've also had several labs use our algorithm and validate their predictions. And so what I'll, what I'll be showing you today is not only our work, but also the work of other, other people, other labs, where they're showing how they've used our, our algorithm and the results that they've obtained. So today, I would like to talk to you about really three topics. First. How do you design DNA to control expression? How do you optimize multi-protein genetic systems? And then I'm going to provide three different examples where we've engineered metabolic pathways. And really the common theme in all those three different examples is that expressing more enzymes is not always the best uh, solution. Sometimes uh, a middle, an intermediate amount of enzymes will give you the most amount of product from your pathway. And we found that to be the case in, in all three of our examples. Uh, and it's something that we should expect in the future. So first, um, you know, just to look at what types of genetic systems that people care, care about, we've got you know, many, many people are interested in expressing proteins for all sorts of different applications. Uh, many times, those proteins are really a single protein, you know, amino acid chain, single chain antibody, or a single subunit enzyme and you can express that protein in a recombinant host, purify it, and that's your product. In other cases, you actually are engineering a multi-protein system where those proteins are being expressed all together in, in a single host, and they're all working together to produce a product. And those types of products would include recombinant vaccines, 
multi-subunit enzyme, or even not natural product pathways where the final product is a small molecule like an antibiotic or an inhibitor that is really acting like a, like a therapeutic. And so uh, our, our methods uh, have been used very heavily for both of these different types of systems, but we truly see that uh, multi-protein genetic systems are more difficult to engineer because there's more moving parts, and so therefore our algorithms will be most useful for these types of multi-protein genetic systems. So let me take uh, a moment to really provide an overview for how proteins are expressed uh, in prokaryotes, and really uh, the, the main factors that control how much protein uh, titer you receive at the end of the day. So of course, uh, DNA is transcribed uh, by RNA polymerase, and it's then translated by the ribosome into protein. That protein then folds, and a folded protein uh, could uh, insert into the membrane uh, at the same time, or it could be secreted outside of that cell. Now, importantly, in order to extract or in order to uh, uh, purify soluble protein, we really want to make sure that the rate of protein production via transcription and translation is not much greater, much faster, than the rate of protein folding. Because if the protein can't fold fast enough, but it, then it won't be able, then you won't get soluble protein. And so this is um, of importance because while we can control transcription rates and translation rates, we don't have fully complete control over the rate of protein folding, the rate of mem membrane insertion, or the rate of secretion. And, and these are all very important questions. They're very complicated processes. And so therefore, when we go to engineer our system, we want to make sure that we're not just like trying to make the cell make as much protein as possible because it could gum up the works of a later downstream process. What we truly want to do is to optimize the whole system, control protein production, and tune it in just such a way that we are producing more soluble protein than if we uh, than, than otherwise. And so uh, importantly, we can do that because using gene synthesis and DNA synthesis, it is now economically possible to rationally design all of your DNA, every single genetic part, that controls all of protein production. So we no longer have to rely upon an existing plasmid or an existing vector. We could, in fact, design every single piece of DNA on a vector or in a geno genomic cassette and in, in order to control every single step of protein production. And so what do we do in my lab? Well, in my lab, we use promoters to carry out dynamic or inducible control of transcription. So, of course, we might use an IPDG inducible promoter, but we also might use a promoter that autonomously responds to different starvation conditions, nutrient conditions, temperature, or other uh, chemicals. So, we are really moving beyond just inducible promoters to really use, utilizing autonomously controlled promoters where we don't, ask, we don't need to add a chemical. We then use ribosome body site sequences to statically increase or decrease the expression of every single one of our proteins in the system. And using our model, we have the ability to control translation rates by at least 10,000 fold. Of course, we make sure that all of our protein coding sequences have been codon optimized for the expression host of interest so that translation elongation is not a rate limiting step. We want to make sure that translation is not a rate limiting step because if we have too many ribosomes bound to our messenger RNA because they're moving too slowly, then it's like we have a traffic jam on our messenger RNA. And that traffic jam will suck up all the ribosomes inside the cell, causing the cell to grow very slowly. So with the, the primary reason why we need codon optimization is to make sure that we don't have too many ribosomes locked onto the messenger RNA. We want them to initiate, elongate very fast, and then to terminate very efficiently. Further, we also use transcriptional terminators that are very efficient, that terminate transcription with at least 95% efficiency, 
And those terminators must be non-repetitive in order to avoid homologous recombination. So when we design our genetic system, we take a very holistic viewpoint. We design everything for the application of interest. But importantly, in order to control protein production on our proportional scale, we rationally design all of the ribosome binding sites controlling the expression of each protein in the system in order to be able to have that capability. So just to give an example, if we were to introduce one particular ribosome binding site sequence into our genetic system, it would be a 35 nucleotide sequence upstream of our star codon of a, of a coding sequence. And, and a particular ribosome binding site sequence might give us a low translation initiation rate and therefore a low production rate of protein. But if instead, if we were to introduce a different ribosome binding site sequence, it would bind faster to the ribosome, bind better, it would initiate translation at a higher rate, and therefore it would give us a higher rate of protein production. So by manipulating the sequence, it's a relatively short sequence, and we, uh, with our biophysical knowledge of the process, we have the ability to control how fast, how well the ribosome binds to that sequence, and therefore we have the ability to control and coordinate and therefore optimize the expression of all the proteins in our system of interest. Okay, I'm going to go into a little bit more of the science about what controls translation initiation inside prokaryotic systems. So there are several interactions, and, it's, and so in our model we account for um, almost all of these interactions that I've listed here, um, and, and so there is the hybridization between the messenger RNA and the ribosomal RNA, and uh, commonly it's called the shine garner sequence. Of course, the better, uh, the, the, the stronger that the ribosomal RNA in the ribosome can bind to the messenger RNA, then the more likely that the ribosome will bind to the messenger RNA. Uh, however, the ribosome also has to unfold structures, secondary structures and tertiary structures, that, it, uh, that exist within the messenger RNA in order for the ribosome to stably bind. In the third interaction, we have hybridization between the star codon and the tRNA. In the fourth interaction, if there is going to be a distance, a spacer, between the shine garner sequence and the star codon, if that distance is either too long or too short, then the ribosome will be stretched or compressed, and that stretching or compression will cause the translation initiation rate to drop because it takes work for the ribosome to maintain that configuration. In the fifth interaction, these are uh, the fifth interaction is uh, you can have messenger RNA uh, secondary structures that block the standby site. These interactions are actually uh, newly characterized by my lab, where we show that depending upon the structures that appear within the upstream standby site, the translation rate can actually change by a hundredfold. Finally, in, in, the, in the last uh, interaction, uh, the kinetics of RNA folding also play a very important role in controlling translation initiation rates. This is not very well studied uh, by really any lab, uh, and, and in my lab we've actually started to study this, and we've shown that de depending upon the folding time of different RNA hairpins, translation rates can actually change by a thousand folds. So there's all these different causes. I just spent, you know, a good minute and a half describing, their, you know, just give, giving an overview uh, of all these different molecular interactions that affect translation initiation rates. And if you wanted to become an expert in RBS design, you would have to read 300 papers on, you know, by over across 30 years of time uh, to really understand how it all works. But what we've done is we've developed a whole uh, biophysical model that allows you to calculate and quantify all of these different causes and allows you to predict the resulting effect. And that's important because these different causes are not independent. And it, and it has, a, as a byproduct, it gives you lots of weird behaviors. I'm just going to give you one example. So let's say that you've got a ribosome binding site sequence and you want to increase the, the, the translation rate of that messenger RNA. Well, somebody told you that if you inserted 
a Shine the Gardener sequence into your RBS, that the translation rate will go up. And yes, that's, that's possible. And, it, and of course it can happen. But in your particular case, when you introduce that Shine the Gardener sequence into your messenger RNA, you can accidentally introduce an additional secondary structure in your messenger RNA that needs to be unfolded by the ribosome. And so in your case, when you introduce that Shine Garner sequence, you might actually lower the translation rate of your messenger RNA because of these competing causes. You, you make one, one interaction stronger, but you actually might make one interaction weaker. And it's these overlapping and confounding causes that make it very difficult to design ribosome body site sequences by eye. So that's why we developed a thermodynamic model that allows you to predict the translation initiation rate of your messenger RNA sequences, taking into account all of these different interactions at the same time, and giving you the ability to predict translation initiation rates on a proportional scale as a result of all of these different interactions. So we validated our biophysical model with many, many different messenger RNA sequences. So I'm showing 624 different ribosome binding site sequences with different coding sequences, different shine garden sequences, different types of secondary structures with branches and different types of hairpins, different types of structures blocking or not blocking the standby site, different lengths of spacer regions. And at the end of the day, where we measured the translation rate of all of these different ribosome and binding site sequences in, 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 in different contexts, and we compare those measurements of approaching expression to our predicted translation initiation rate. And importantly, we carry out these measurements under steady state conditions where we grow our cultures on a really a 24-hour period with several different stereo-dilutions to maintain them in the exponential uh, phase of growth in order to obtain the most precise protein expression measurement. We then compare those measurements to our predictions, and we find that, yes, indeed, we, we get the expected you know, linear uh, behavior, linear relationship between our predictions and our measurements with a very good correlation. And that tells us that we have the ability to predict and to control translation rates uh, to within a pretty good degree. We can, when we predict the translation rate, that prediction comes true to within two-fold on average. Now, our you know, other labs in other parts of the world have uh, taken our algorithm and they've used it to, uh, to design their own sequences, perform their own measurements, and here is their comparison. Uh, in their comparison, they're using a one reporter RFP and uh, it's one library of different rabbits and binding site sequences. And they, in fact, show even better comparisons uh, compared to us because we use many different reporters. They're using a single reporter. Our sequences are characterized on many different days. They're character characterizing it on a single day. And so you can see that um, I'm showing you both the best case and the worst case for our, for our algorithm, uh, what, you could, what you should expect. Importantly, our models are based on physical interactions that are that maintain that are basically the same interaction regardless of the different hosts in which the model is used. So, for example, we have predicted and measured and compared our, our, our we've predicted sorry we've designed sequences and we've measured protein expression levels in many different hosts, including E. coli, BL21, Pseudomonas fluorescens. Salmonella typhimurium and Corbacterium glutamicum using the same reporter, and we've measured their expression levels and compared them to our predicted translation initiation rates. And in each case, we find that the model is able to correctly predict uh, the amount of the translation rate uh, for each of these different messenger RNAs. And what this says is that even though uh, each of these different hosts uh, have different, uh, slightly different ribosomes. We're able to account for those differences in the ribosomal RNA. We're able to correctly predict their translation initiation rate. Uh, and you know, and and what the reason why uh, biophysics, RNA biophysics, is 
pretty much uh, the same in each of these different hosts is that prokaryotic gene expression uh, is very well conserved. Uh, and so therefore, all of the, the key proteins that are responsible for translating messenger RNAs uh, may, mainly have the same uh, levels of interaction with their messenger RNAs. So how do we take advantage of our biophysical model? How do we start to answer important questions using that model? Well, if you were to try to design a ribosome binding site sequence by, by, you know, with, with, a, with a manual calculation or by eye, the odds of picking a correct sequence to increase your translation rates by a certain factor, the odds of picking the correct sequence would be like picking the winning NCAA, NCAA bracket. You know, the odds uh, are like, you know, 1 in 1 to the uh, 10 to the 21, so extremely small. So in order to design specific RBS sequences that give you a very specific amount of protein production in your host of interest, we use computational optimization to specify a target protein production rate and then convert that target to a specific RBS sequence. And computational optimization is a whole uh, field of, of uh, mathematics and engineering where there's all sorts of different algorithms that allow you to specify your degrees of freedom, your objective function, and your, your model that carries out prediction. And using these different types of algorithms, you can converge to a very specific solution, in this case, a ribosome binding site sequence, that meets your target objective. And so the RBS calculator currently uses a simulated annealing algorithm. We have other algorithms, such as the RBS library calculator, that uses a genetic algorithm. In all these different cases, you can type in your target protein production rate on a proportional scale, and then it will design an RBS sequence for you. So here's an example where if you would like to design an RBS sequence to increase protein production by 20-fold, well, you would start off by using the RBS calculator to predict the translation initiation rate of your existing RBS sequence. So in this case, that, will, that prediction is 1,000 AU, which is a proportional scale. You would then multiply that number of 1,000 by a factor of 20 to give to give you 20,000, and then you would type that 20,000 number into our optimization algorithm, so the RBS calculator in forward engineering mode, and it would design for you a new ribosome binding site sequence that would give you that 20,000 translation initiation rate. You would then take that sequence and clone it in, in place of your original sequence in order to increase protein production by 20-fold. So other labs have used our algorithm to express different proteins. In this case, I'm showing the results from a study uh, by Rake Grumberg from the Serrano lab, where they expressed 25 different proteins with different ribosome binding site sequences, of course, different CDS sequences. And importantly, some of these proteins fold very well. Some of them do not. And therefore, this is a great uh, test case because most of the time, people are unaware of whether or not their protein will be a fast-folding protein or slow-folding protein, whether it will be soluble or insoluble. And you know, pretty much, we, we just figure it out as we go along. And, and so how do we know if the RBS calculator will give us more protein if the protein is you know, more likely to be soluble or insoluble? Well, in this case, they did indeed find that across all of their different proteins, some of them were more soluble, some of them were more insoluble, some of them affected the growth rate by quite a lot. That is, they were insoluble and they had lower ODs, or they were soluble and they had higher ODs. And the question was, is there some way to figure out the relationship between the sequence, uh, the, you know, the, the RBS sequence, uh, of all these different constructs and the amount of protein that would be produced. And so what they did, they took all of their protein titers, they divided by their ODs in order to calculate a protein yield, and then they compared that protein yield 
to the RBS calculator's predicted translation initiation rate. So importantly, in both cases, when using either their standard expression screen, which is basically a, a vector that uses a T7 promoter and BL21E3 at 37 degrees uh, growth uh, temperature, uh, or they're, they're more, uh, they had another expression um, uh, mode where they took the same construct, they put it into BL21DE3 PYC, which has a lower, luck, lower level of T7 RNA polymerase stickiness uh, at a lower temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. So in both of these different uh, expression uh, assays, they found that the RBS calculator was able to predict why they had more protein per OD. That is, a higher translation initiation rate did indeed give them a higher amount of protein per ODSL. And, uh, but importantly, that was, uh, those results only held for the soluble protein. Uh, these, uh, the black dots in this case are the soluble protein. The, wh the, the whites or the outline uh, are the insoluble protein. So if they had more insoluble protein, then it was not clear if there was any correlation. Okay, uh, so I'm going to talk more about how the RBS calculator works. Uh, it's not, there's no magic, it's not a black box. Uh, we really built this model to understand how and why the ribosome binds better to different ribosome binding site sequences in order to gain control over an important step in gene expression. And so just to start off, translation is a multi-step process. And if you do, uh, if you carry out your design correctly, then translation initiation is the rate limiting step of the translation process. So we can quantify how well the ribosome binds to a particular ribosome binding site sequence according to a Gibbs free energy, a total amount of work that the ribosome needs to exert in order to bind to the messenger RNA. And the, rate, the ratio between the bound ribosome and the free ribosome is going to be proportional to exponential negative beta delta G. So in statistical thermodynamics, there is this concept of an ensemble, where any time you've got a pool of different messenger RNAs interacting and binding to a pool of different free ribosomes, what you can say is that the binding free energy of the ribosome to a specific or a particular messenger RNA can tell you how well or how likely the ribosome will bind to that messenger RNA. And this relationship uh, is, is, this theory can uh, hold for many different systems. And, uh, and so here the theory says that the rate of translation initiation is proportional to exponential negative beta delta G. Uh, and that it also um, explains why overexpressing or, or increasing the translation rate of one messenger RNA can actually lower the translation rate of other messenger RNAs in your system. Because at the end of the day, all of these different ribosomes are competing to bind to these messenger RNAs, and you can calculate the effects of increasing translation rate on one messenger RNA on the effects of other messenger RNAs. So I just wanted to get that out there. How do we calculate the binding free energy of the ribosome to the messenger RNA? Well, we have developed a free energy model that allows us to input in a messenger RNA sequence and calculate the strength of all the different molecular interactions that control this binding free energy. We quantify the strength of each of these different interactions according to a Gibbs free energy and then we sum up all of those different Gibbs free energies to arrive at our total free energy change. And then we can relate that total free energy change to the rate of translation initiation. So in, in, in all thermodynamic models, you always start off by specifying your initial state and your final state. Our initial state is the messenger RNA folded into its minimum free energy structure, and that, that energy is the delta G messenger RNA. In the final state, 
we have the ribosome bound to the messenger RNA, and it makes several energetically favorable contacts with the messenger RNA at the star codon, at the shina garner sequence, and with the ribosomal platform. There, there's also penalties for uh, if the spacing region is too long or too short, we've got a positive delta G spacing. If the, delta, if the standby site is blocked by a structure, we have a positive delta G standby. If you add up all these terms, you come up with our, our total free energy change. Here's an example where we input in a messenger RNA sequence and we run through our calculations. So in our initial state of the messenger RNA, we have a secondary structure with several different hairpins. We have a hairpin here, a hairpin here, and a hairpin here. Now, these two hairpins are overlapping with the ribosome footprint shown here. It's these two hairpins that must be unfolded in order for the ribosome to bind and form the final state. So you'll notice that there are additional secondary structures in the final state here and here that are still folded. So when we say that we have a delta G of unfolding of messenger RNA structures, very important to specify exactly which messenger RNA structures need to be unfolded in order for the ribosome to bind. And it's important to realize that not all secondary structures has to be unfolded for that to happen. In the final state, we have additional energetically favorable interactions, so the Shonagarno to the ribosomal RNA, the star codon to the tRNA, and so we have negative delta Gs here and here, but we also have positive delta G, so a positive delta G of spacing, because this spacer region is just a little bit too long, it's not optimal, and therefore, the ribosome needs, it is stretched, and it needs to exert 1.2 kilocal per mole of energy to maintain this configuration. You might be wondering how we came up with all these numbers. It's a combination of a nearest neighbor RNA free energy model and a lot of experiments where we systematically measure the effects of different structures, different spacing regions, different star codons, different standby sites, and I'll show some of, the, some of those results later. Or maybe I'll do it right now. Okay, so we've got a set of experiments shown here where we systematically determine how the ribosome interacts with these very diverse types of messenger RNA uh, sequences and structures. So in all of these different structures, a portion of the upstream region is being occluded We've got a structure upstream of the Shinogarno here. We've got a structure upstream of the Shinogarno here. We've got a big giant structure upstream of the Shinogarno here and you know, similarly here. How does the ribosome interact with these different types of messenger RNA? Well, as it turns out, we came up with a very simple and elegant reason and mechanism for how the ribosome interacts with all of these different structures. And at its heart, it's all about surface area. If the ribosomal platform can make contact with a large number of single-stranded RNA nucleotides called surface area, if, it ha if the messenger RNA has a lot of surface area at its upstream region, then the ribosome can sit down and, in and initiate binding to that messenger RNA without any penalty. And so if the standby site region has a large surface area, it'll have a high translation rate and a zero delta G distortion, which uh, gives us a, a zero delta G standby site. But if we have these large secondary structures occluding the standby site, then the only factor that significantly affected translation rate was the surface area and not, the un not just the unfolding of these structures. So moving on, the, another big uh, interaction and factor that controls translation is the length of the spacer region. So if you have a short spacer region or a very long spacer region, you will not have a very high translation rate. 
And so there is a direct relationship between the spacer region length, S, and the translation rate that occurs. And when you go to work out the thermodynamics of that process, you receive this red line, which is the delta G spacing at each of the different spacing lengths. And as we can see, if the spacing length is longer than the optimal of five nucleotides, and if the ribosome is stretched, we get very much a quadratic curve. And that quadratic curve is very much reminiscent of Hooke's law for a rigid spring. And so we like to think of the ribosome as a rigid spring, whereby if you ever you know, pull apart one of those rigid dumbbells, you have to exert work in order to keep that dumbbell apart. Whereas uh, if, the, if the dumbbell, if the rigid spring is relaxed, then it, you, there's no need to exert work to keep it in that configuration. And of course, if the ribosome is compressed with a very small spacing region, then the delta G spacing is very high. It's very difficult to keep the ribosome in a compressed state. Another question. Is the, are ribosome binding sites a modular genetic part? This comes up a lot because many times people will reuse the same RBS sequence with different coding sequences and they will receive different amounts of protein expression. What we show very explicitly uh, and, and you know, over five years ago is that when you reuse different ribosome binding site sequences, sorry, if you reuse the same ribosome binding site sequence with different coding sequences, then you can change the protein production rate and the protein uh, expression. So in this one case, we use the, reuse the same RBS but change the coding sequence from RFP to LAC-I RFP and the expression level uh, dropped by 21 fold. In this case, the expression level dropped by 530 fold and 17 fold here. So in all three cases, changing the coding sequence had a significant effect on the translation rate. How do we make those predict how do we account for this effect? How do we make predictions to make sure that this is no longer a problem? Well, in order to figure out very precisely which structures inhibit translation and which structures do not inhibit translation, what we did is we introduced different secondary structures inside the coding sequence in order to measure when and how much a messenger RNA structure would in, uh, inhibit a translation. And, and in order to really answer this question, why does the coding sequence affect the translation rate? And the answer is different messenger RNA structures will form either within the coding sequence itself or between the ribosome binding site sequence and the coding sequence. And if those structures are within the ribosome's footprint region, then they will inhibit translation. But if, they, if those structures are outside the ribosome's footprint region, then they do not inhibit translation. And through this experimentation, we, we are able to very precisely state that the ribosome's footprint is 13 nucleotides long. So if you are introducing a ribosome binding site sequence and a coding sequence, and if together they form a secondary structure that is within the ribosome's footprint of 13 nucleotides, then you, it will inhibit translation. But if there's only a secondary structure outside of that footprint region, it will not inhibit translation at all. Okay, so I'm going to now segue into more applications of both the RBS calculator and the RBS library calculator. Here I'm going to show three different examples where we have applied our design algorithms to systematically optimize the expression of different multi-protein genetic systems, in this case these are metabolic pathways, in order to overproduce desired products or in one case to maximally detoxify lignocellulosic feedstock. So I'll be talking about a three enzyme pathway that produces a carotenoid pigment, a five enzyme pathway that rapidly regenerates NADPH, 
and a six enzyme pathway that consumes furfural, which is an inhibitor. So this is an important question that is it's a very broad question that, we, that we'd like to answer. And the question is, how do we search for the optimal enzyme expression level to maximize a pathway's productivity? But we want to do so using the smallest number of experiments. We don't want to have to characterize 10,000 or 100,000 different pathway variants just to find one that worked well. We want to create a map, a relationship, between RBS sequence, enzyme expression level, and pathway productivity in a four-dimensional space, if we have a three-enzyme pathway, we want to create that relationship in order to systematically and reliably maximize pathway productivity by finding optimal enzyme expression levels. So how do we do this? Only characterizing 100 versus 10,000 pathway variants. So I'm going to give you a comparison of two different approaches. If you were to randomly introduce degenerate nucleotides into an RBS sequence and ask the question, OK, how much enzyme is being expressed for, my, for a two enzyme pathway? Well, this would be the answer. And we would see that we are not really covering the whole space. In, in, you know, so we can increase and decrease enzyme expression across a very large space, up to 100,000 fold. And when we introduce a random RBS library, there's a whole region of this space that we're not covering. And instead, if we were to use an optimized RBS library that does not, that does not have many, many variants, but was optimized to cover the whole space, then we would get this behavior over here. And my favorite analogy for the optimal search strategy shown here is the game of Battleship, where we truly want to fire our tor torpedoes at different places on the game board, spreading them out in order to search in the most efficient way possible to find the battleship. And if we use an optimized RBS library, we can find the battleship. But if we are just willy-nilly introducing random RBS uh, sequences, then there's a good chance that we're going to miss it. So how do we use the RBS calculator to design optimized RBS libraries? Well, we developed a new algorithm called the RBS library calculator that uses the biophysical model that we've developed to systematically optimize a degenerate RBS sequence with a small number of degeneracies that will give you a large variation in translation rate across a very large scale. And so here I'm showing six different RBS sequences that vary translation across a 100,000-fold scale. And so this is our objective function for the algorithm. We want the smallest number of RBS variants that give us the largest coverage of the translation rate space. We've developed this algorithm, and we've tested it and validated it with many different parameters. We've chosen different coding, uh, different reporters, so RFP and GFP, and different resolution of our search. So here I'm showing three different resolutions. In one case, a high-resolution 36 variant RBS library that systematically searches a translation rate space across a 52,000-fold 52, scale. In this example, I'm showing a 16-variant RBS library that spans a 100,000-fold uh, scale in translation rate space. And here, there's, this is only an 8-variant RBS library, so only eight different RBS sequences, but with very precisely uh, positioned mutations we are able to vary the translation rate by about uh, uh, a thousandfold. So how do we use the RBS library calculator? So we're going to show you one example. Well, actually, I'll show you several examples. But here's our first example, where we have used the RBS library calculator to design three different 16-variant RBS libraries. 
and they vary translation rate by quite a lot. And we then use combinatorial cloning, specifically we use the Gibson method to combinatorially assemble all 16 by 16 by 16 different RBS libraries together into a plasmid. And so at the end of the day, we are constructing 4,096 different plasmids expressing our enzymes CRTE, CRTB, and CRTI with many different RBS. And so at the end of the day, what we want to see are differing expression levels in CRTE, B, and I, and then we're measuring the amount of neurosporine, the amount of product that is being produced. So we carried out this experiment, we plated, we randomly picked 73 different colonies, we cultured, and we measured how much product is being produced. And I'm just showing that in, in one library, so this is a single library, a single day, really, we are measuring pathway productivity, everything from you know, nothing, where presumably we've got very low expression of all three enzymes, to a good amount of product where we have now more expression of all three enzymes. And we like to call this our search mode because we are really searching through our four-dimensional space where we are varying the expression levels of CRTE, B, and I across that huge space. And we don't know what we're going to get, so we're, we're searching for, the, for you know, how much productivity will take place in the pathway. Importantly, our searching is very efficient because we are never recharacterizing the same pathway variants twice. All these different pathway variants have different combinations of expression levels giving us different amounts of pathway productivity. As it turns out, that type of data where we are carrying out efficient search is the best type of data in order to develop a model for how the entire pathway works. That is, if we have data where we vary the enzyme expression level of CRTE, B, and I, and we're measuring neurosporine, then we're able to develop a model and to extract out the kinetic parameters for all the enzymes in the system. And that's because by varying enzyme expression levels, we're varying reaction rates, and by varying reaction rates, we're varying pathway productivity, and using modeling and optimization, we can actually go back and figure out the kinetics of these enzymes. Using that type of analysis, we can then carry out rational design of the entire pathway, and we can predict the optimal enzyme expression levels to maximize the pathway's productivity. So here is an example. Here are the chemical reactions. We write down our system of differential equations. We've got 38 unknown parameters in our model, but we have 73 measurements. And importantly, these 73 measurements are literally independent and non-redundant. And based on that data, and our model, we can carry out optimization to identify all of the kinetic parameters of the reactions in this system. We plug those kinetic parameters into a in, back into the model, and we can make a very precise set of predictions, which we call a sequence expression activity map. Our sequence expression activity map allows us to input in any RBS sequence. We can then predict translation rates. We can then predict the pathway's productivity across a very large scale. We can now use that map for all sorts of different applications, including uh, first interpolating. So let's say you would like to design a set of pathways that have some amount of pathway, some amount of product some amount of flux. Well, we can use the, the pathway map to then design RBS sequences that give targeted translation rates, that give targeted pathway productivity. So here we've tested that idea 
by designing 19 additional pathway variants with different combinations of RBS sequences, which give us different translation rates, which give us different predicted pathway productivity. We then compare those, uh, those predictions to our experimental measurements of neurosporine productivity, and we find that on average, our pathway map was accurate to within 28%. So using our, this approach, we're able to design pathway variants to hit targeted pathway productivity to within 28%. So most of the time, people don't care about just, you know, designing a pathway with an intermediate pathway productivity. Uh, it, there are certain, some circumstances where that's really important, but in many cases, we want to really extrapolate and maximize the pathway's productivity. So in this case, we use the same approach to extrapolate our predictions and say, all right, we've got this map. Which enzyme expression level will give us a higher pathway productivity? And so then, with that idea, we redesigned three new RBS libraries that target this region in the translation rate space, and with the expectation that this region of the translation rate space is going to give us a higher pathway productivity because we've extrapolated using the map into this direction. And that's exactly what we find. We introduce the three RBS libraries. We carry out the combinatorial cloning. We measure pathway productivity, and we increase the pathway productivity by even more. In fact, by, by this level over here, we've completely exhausted the precursor biosynthesis of the organism. And what we show in our published paper is that in order to make even more pathway product at this point, we need to then modify the genome of the organism in order to make more precursor, and then you can make more product. We also would like to show that you can keep going and really overexpress all of these enzymes. And what the, what the pathway map predicts is that at some point, if you overexpress these enzymes, you will get a less amount of product. And so we, here we have very specific predictions that if you have four different pathway variants with four different expression level ratios of CRT, E, B, and I, then you will get four different behaviors when you systematically increase the transcription rate. So we carried out this experiment where this is, this is the prediction, four different pathway variants, systematically increasing the transcription rate. This is the data where we find that in all cases, if you increase the transcription rate to its maximum, yes, indeed, the pathway productivity starts to decrease. And if you have a certain stoichiometry of your enzyme, the pathway productivity actually starts to decrease faster than in the other one. And so in the black and the red, we see a higher amount of product with lower transcription rates, but then it peaks early and it goes down. With the yellow and the green pathway variants, we have lower amounts of pathway productivity at low transcription rates, and it doesn't really peak until the very end. And that's matches exactly this behavior shown here. And importantly, with one model, with one map of the pathway, you can explain lots of very um, difficult to understand data sets if, if we didn't have the model. But because we have the model, it all makes sense. Okay. In our second example, we tackled a five enzyme pathway used to rapidly regenerate NADPH. This is important because many biorenewable chemicals, such as succinic acid, such as uh, terpenoids, like amorphodiene, uh, taxidiene, uh, and a lot of other organic acids, they all require NADPH to produce that product. And a lot of hosts, including E. coli, do not regenerate enough NADPH in order to overproduce those types of products. So in, in this second example, we've taken a five enzyme pathway from Zymomonas mobilis. We design everything from scratch. That is the only thing we take from Zymomonas are, are the amino acid sequences of the enzyme. And we redesign the whole genetic system to express these five enzymes in a tunable fashion. 
with the goal of now we're going to rapidly regenerate NADPH with this new synthetic entenaire deuterose pathway in E. coli. And so we used our operon calculator to optimize all the operons in the system, including the translation rate, the RNA stabilities, as well as the assembly cost and time. We rationally design those sequences. We then integrate those operons directly into the E. coli genome. So our first step is to integrate those systems into the genome. We then use the RBS library calculator and MAGE from the church lab in order to systematically mutate the ribosome bonding sites controlling the expression of all five enzymes in our system. So this is a five-dimensional expression space giving us a six dimension uh, uh, of behavior. And we can measure how much NADPH is being regenerated using a new fluorescent protein that binds to NADPH and then glows blue. And this, this reporter is actually an oxidoreductase that oxidizes uh, NADPH and uses that reaction to glow blue. So it's also a sink for NADPH. Interestingly, there was no, even though some of our pathway variants produce quite a lot of NADPH up to 25 fold, there was no correlation between pathway productivity and growth rate. We then selected 23 of the pathway variants from our screening. We sequenced those pathway variants, and we can now use the RBS calculator to predict the translation rate from those five different modified RBS sequences to figure out the relationship between RBS sequence, translation rate, and NADPH regeneration. So here's one example where in, our, uh, in, in one variant of our system, we are expressing more EDA, expressing less PGL, and, and, that, and it's a two modified system, the two modifications. The original system, our first version 1.0, is shown in blue. So here is our, uh, the result from our 20, uh, 23 different pathway variants, where I'm showing the enzyme expression level for all the different five enzymes in those pathways. Uh, and you can see that more of, well, the, the general consensus from all this data is that more of everything did not actually result in more NADPH regeneration. And this is an important theme that seems to be consistent in all of our different pathway engineering. If you express more of all the enzymes, you do not always get more pathway productivity, more NADPH regeneration. So here is an example where we are using our synthetic and their deuteros pathway to overproduce a product. And in this case, we are picking our CRT EDI pathway that we previously engineered. It produces neurosporine. And so we're now connecting our synthetic and their deuteron pathway with the MEP uh, pathway already present in E. coli to our synthetic CRT EBI pathway. And with this data really shows us that if we do not engineer the genome of our organism, we are producing small amounts of neurospore. As soon as we engineer the genome of our organism, then we are producing more neurospore, but we are still limited by NADPH. And then when we introduce different EV pathways that are rapidly regenerating NADPH, then we're producing more neurospore because now it's producing more NADPH and we're eliminating that bottleneck. So our best variant shown here, where our best ED variant so far is increasing the expression of EDA, EDD, it's lowering the expression of PGL, and it's increasing expression of ZWF by these amounts. And this particular antenaer deuteron pathway increased neurosporine production by a very high amount, and, and so it gives us uh, a confirmation that not only can we engineer synthetic NR deuteros pathways to increase NADPH generation, 
with those blue fluorescent protein reporter as, a, as the measurement, we can also see that those, those same type of results can come through in a downstream pathway that is now consuming that NADPH to produce a final product. Uh, in, a, in my final example, we have a six enzyme pathway that is consuming furfural and converting it into alpha ketoglutarate. This is important because hydrolyzed lignin cellulose contains lots of cheap sugar, but it also contains several different microbial inhibitors, including furfural. And so we've engineered this pathway to allow an organism to rapidly catabolize furfural without expending ATP, without expending NADPH. And so in within six hours, this pathway is consuming all the furfural, and it's producing some furoic acid, which is then further reduced after 18 hours. We then used our RBS library calculator to modify the ribosome binding site sequence of one of the enzymes, HMFD, and we see a nonlinear relationship between the HMFD expression and the pathway's activity. So of course, if we don't express that much HMFD, we do not have that much peripheral catabolic uh, rate. But if we express a little bit more, we see quite a large increase in HMF, uh, in peripheral catabolism. But then as we increase more and more uh, HMFD expression, we see a steady drop off in, in catabolism. That is, uh, there, HMFD uh, could be part of a complex. And as you express more of that a single subunit, you could actually be, uh, be uh, sequestering or um, uh, skewing the, the, the active protein complex in the system, and therefore there would be less activity overall. And then finally, at some extreme amounts of HMFD expression, uh, you don't get any furfural catabolism at all. So clearly, there's a nonlinear relationship, and you really want to systematically search the translation rate space in order to find the optimum enzyme expression level that gives you the maximum amount of pathway productivity. Okay, so as I explained, our methods allow you to control protein expression, they allow you to optimize multi-protein genetic systems, and these methods are useful both in single protein genetic systems as well as multi-protein genetic systems where you can now modify RBSs design them in order to control expression, and then use a small number of RBS variants in order to systematically optimize protein production rates to maximize the amount of soluble protein that you receive from your single protein system, or maximum amount of final product from your multi-protein system, whether that final product is a, is a natural product, like an antibiotic, or a multi-subunit enzyme. And um, just, to, just to sum up, we, when you are engineering these types of systems, you can build up a map, really a knowledge base, for how enzyme expression controls pathway productivity, so that when you go to design another system that is similar to the previous one, now you're not starting from scratch. You have a, a knowledge about how your system works so that you can clone less and know more about how your system works so that the next one can be developed even faster. Uh, that's it for this webinar. I really would like to thank all of my students for their hard work in the lab. And I'd like to thank all of uh, my funding sources, the National Science Foundation, the uh, Air Force Office of Scientific Research, the Office of Naval Research, DARPA, and the Penn State Institute for the Energy and the Environment. I'd be happy to answer any questions, but before I uh, hand off, I would like to note that you can visit the GenScript website for more information, where GenScript now allows you to use the RBS calculator and the RBS library calculator to design your own DNA sequences for all of these different applications that I mentioned, plus a whole lot more. I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, thanks, Dr. Salas. Now we are moving to the Q&A session, and we are going to look at the chat box and to collect all the questions.
questions that come in through the course of this webinar, and Dr. Salas will answer them one by one, time permitting. I'm looking through. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe you can. Sure. Okay, so yes. First question: Do you see translation elongation becoming a limiting factor when designing strong RBS sequences? Well, it's funny that you should ask that, because yes, indeed, we do see that effect, uh, and so. If you are using a protein coding sequence which, which has not been correctly code and optimized, then you will indeed see a expression plateau as you systematically increase translation initiation rate. Everyone should still be able to see this, right? Yeah. Okay, very good. And, and so it, we, in order to test, you know, in order to really show this, we took um, one protein coding sequence, uh, we systematically increased uh, translation, you can see the plateau, the orange lines. In order to just show that it, was, it really is elongation limited, uh, we, we created a fusion protein where now the first uh, 60 nucleotides of that coding sequence are from a new protein. The remaining portion of the protein stays the same. And so we, we uh, run through the experiments again uh, with a new RBS, and we show that the plateau has stayed the same. So that plateau was really dependent not upon the RBS, not upon the end terminal uh, portion of the coding sequence. It was really intrinsic to the latter portion of the coding sequence that did not change. So that's some good data showing that some coding sequences simply have a low translation rate capacity. Now, now if we take a different coding sequence where we have, of course, uh, introduced staff codons, or uh, then with, with a high uh, translation rate capacity, then, you know, as you increase translation and initiation, we don't see that same plateau. So, I came prepared for that question. Okay, um, next question. I successfully used your RBS designer to make RBSs for a thermos, thermophilus. However, however, I take it that your model designer worked at 37 degrees. Do you think it might be an issue, and do you plan on offering different temperatures in the model? That is an excellent question because we have varied temperature in our growth conditions, and we have remeasured translation rates, and they do not change. I should, I should be very specific. The relative translation rates do not change that much at different temperatures. And I say relative because, of course, when you decrease temperature for, let's say, for E. coli, you, you have a lower temperature the expression of all proteins does indeed go down. And therefore, if you have a reporter, you're going to be expressing less of that reporter. Of course, the culture will, will grow slower as well. And I, and I believe that there is just a, this, that, that sort of global effect introduces a huge confounding factor in to be able to predict the delta G at different temperatures. Uh, and it's also, you can also make the argument that it's not, uh, so even though, even though we're, we're calculating and predicting a delta G uh, at a temperature, what's really more important is the differences in delta G at a particular temperature. Because keep in mind, you've got a pool of messenger RNAs competing with a pool of ribosomes, and the reason why your protein is higher, expressed at a higher rate compared to other proteins is not just its delta G, it's actually the differences in delta G in your host of interest at that particular temperature. So the model actually does a much better job predicting the differences in delta G compared to an absolute delta G. I hope that made sense. Uh, is your calculator also valid for proteins with many disulfide bonds because their formation can cause a bottleneck in translation speed. So this is definitely related to the previous question, where if the coding sequence has a pretty low maximum translation rate capacity, then that really is the maximum rate of translation initiation that you should expect to be able to obtain. And if you go any higher, 
then you'll have too many ribosomes on the messenger RNA, which will cause a bottleneck. It, will, it can initiate uh, the SSRA, uh, uh, you know, protein uh, nonsense uh, decay uh, rescue system, uh, which will degrade your protein. In fact, uh, so there's other factors that will come into play when your when translation elongation becomes rate limiting. Okay, so your calculator uses data derived from exponential growth. How does the prediction relate to expression in other growth phases, such as late log or stationary phase? This is a good question because certainly from a transcriptional point of view, there's a lot of things that change between exponential phase of growth and stationary phase of growth. Uh, certainly, when you look at ribosome production, ribosome production slows by quite a lot as the cells enter stationary phase. So empirically, what we observe is that if you engineer an RBF with a high translation initiation rate, you should expect that as your culture enters stationary phase, you will get a higher accumulation of that protein. And so in general, you will get more accumulation of protein at the stationary phase because you know, protein production slows down, but then the growth rate also slows down. And so in that coordination of events during the stationary phase, it's sort of like a, a, a lot of protein accumulates, and then it stops growing, so it never gets diluted. So we, we see like about a 2x factor, um, uh, you, know, ex, you know, a certain amount of protein at exponential phase, and then as it enters stationary phase, it accumulates by a factor of 2-ish, uh, and then growth stop. Growth will stop. Uh, uh, ah, okay. How could the RBS calculator be useful to design riboswitches? That's an excellent question because we've recently developed the riboswitch calculator, which uses the free energy model of the RBS calculator but now introduces additional interactions between the messenger RNA and, and different ligands that allows you to rationally design new synthetic riboswitches using many different RNA aptamers in order to convert them, in order to uh, have them bind the ligands and activate the translation of your reporter of interest. Uh, so we've engineered synthetic riboswitches uh, that bind to uh, six different RNA, that they utilize six different RNA aptamers that bind to six different chemicals. Uh, and that work has been submitted and will hopefully be out soon. Can the model be used? to predict the optimal pathway productivity with various RBS strengths for different genes? That's a very good question because, yes, uh, through our approach of systematically varying translation rates for your multi-protein system of interest and then measuring the effects of those differing translation rates, you can actually pull out the, the, the uh, enzymes kinetics or, or the interactions between those proteins and you can then predict the optimal uh, enzyme expression level to achieve maximum pathway productivity. Uh, and uh, we, we showed uh, one example completely of that, and it's published in Molecular Systems Biology in 2014. Um, we, we, uh, we've, um, we're now automating that approach, uh, and we're developing an algorithm whereby anyone can submit their different pathway variant sequences with different promoters or different RBSs and different measured productivity, and the algorithm will predict for you the, uh, the, the enzyme's kinetics parameters and the uh, en optimal enzyme expression level. Let's see. We have a couple questions about um, Drosophila and uh, cells and mammalian cells, and I would like to note that uh, translation does take place pretty differently uh, in prokaryotes versus eukaryotes. 
we do have some um, some results for controlling expression in eukaryotes, uh, but we have not yet released any uh, predictive models uh, uh, for controlling eukaryotic expression. All right. Thank you, Dr. Salas. So um, just uh, by way of uh, closing, for those who uh, do not know enough about the RBS, uh, our technical account manager group will be happy to assist you design the RBS that will suit your protein expression needs. And uh, as uh, Dr. Salas already said, the RBS calculator and RBS uh, library calculators are available on GenScript's uh, website and you are free to use. And this webinar is recorded and will be archived on GenScript's uh, webinar webpage. And so is the PDF file of the webinar PowerPoint slide. And with that, I thank Dr. Salas again for your informative uh, webinar and thank you all for listening in. And have a good day. <laughs>